Nice. Okay. Any more pluses for today, guys? Okay. Uh, so uh, today we have uh, the certification day number five, which is dedicated to UI UX, and uh, we are we will spend this meeting together with Thomas Gaze, who will tell us about the UI UX certification. So to us, Thomas, uh, you are welcome. Good evening, Victor. Pleasure to be here. So let's get started. This is a webinar about the certified professional for usability and uh, user experience. And uh, these slides that I'm showing here have been prepared uh, uh, as a, as a co-joint activity between Marcel Schwarzmeier from ISQI. He cannot be with us this evening, but uh, it's Marcel and myself who have prepared those slides. Um, a few things about uh, ISQI. Well, probably you've heard everything about ISQI before, but uh, I'll just go uh, to say a few words about myself. Um, I am co-founder and the pr ac currently acting president of the UXQB, which is the International Usability and User Experience Qualification Board. I've been working in the field of usability and user experience for the last 25 years. And uh, I myself have been working the first 10 years actually as a usability tester uh, for a, for a so-called notified body. Notified bodies are official uh, institutes testing products such as medical products before they come on the market. Also toys, which can be dangerous from, from when, when, be, when used by children. Uh, and uh, of course, software, many software products we tested there, business software, medical software. And this I've been doing for the first 10 years of my career. And after 10 years of usability testing, I decided to set up a uh, consultancy that mainly focused on user requirements. And uh, user requirements is also something I want to talk about a bit later. But uh, basically, you can say whenever uh, users of an interactive system are having trouble uh, with that system, this is an expression of unmet user requirements. And uh, I've been working uh, for the last 15 years, uh, more or less full time, with simply finding out what people need when they use a product. Uh, and how they would want to use or how they would even need to use that product. And uh, this is what I've been doing for the last 15 years and I'm rather engaged in uh, standardization activities. There's plenty of knowledge about usability and user experience that you can actually read in ISO standards. Uh, I'm editor of some of them and I'm also leading a committee uh, in ISO, International Standardization Organization, which develops the so-called common industry format. It's also referred to as SIF, the common industry format for usability. Uh, in 2013, I was, uh, I was awarded a, a so-called Usability Achievement Award by the German Usability Professionals Association. And uh, I've been doing mainly practical work. A little bit of history about the UXQB. People always wonder how do these boards emerge? Um, if I go back in, in history of the certification scheme, Certified Professional for Usability and User Experience, it actually all started approximately in 2007, where within the uh, German Usability Professionals Association, a working group was founded uh, to come up with a standardized role model for usability professionals in industry. The, the reason or the motivation behind that was uh, to a large extent that usability people were putting all kinds of job titles on their business cards and uh, industry got quite confused about all those interesting fancy titles like usability architect, usability engineer, UX designer, UX tester, UX evaluator, UX analyst, and all kinds of, of, uh, of uh, 
let's say self perceptions were were actually there by usability people so we inventorized all of those titles and asked ourselves what is it actually that people are doing and in 2010 we came up with a with a standardized role model explaining what roles are actually there in a uh, usability engineering and user user experience engineering and once we had that role model we actually started working uh, on on the the quality that uh, has to be achieved when coming up with uh, certain deliverables within usability and user experience one simple or one obvious deliverable is the the user interface prototype but uh, there was a lot of standardization activities within the German UPA. And once all those standards were there, we realized in 2010 that more and more people were asking for a, let's say a confirmation that they are doing the right thing and that they are doing the right thing right. And that led to a certification scheme that was originally developed within the German UPA, but then based on so much international uh, demand and inquiries about getting certified in 2013, the UXQB was uh, well founded as an independent international body that just uh, has the task to set up and maintain a standard for certifying usability professionals. That was in 2013. There we launched the so-called CPUX, which is the certified professional for, let's call it UX for tonight, um, uh, foundation level. In 2014, we came up with our first advanced level uh, certification. And that was the certified, let's call them usability tester. The long term is sort of certified professional for usability and user experience uh, slash uh, usability testing and evaluation. Well, that's the, the certified usability tester. And in 2016, about one and a half years ago, uh, we, we launched the advanced level user requirements engineering. Some people these days refer to user research when, when, you, when they ask themselves, what, what do you mean by user requirements engineering? But we on purpose called it uh, user requirements engineering because uh, as a usability professional, you should be uh, really advised to, to in general apply approaches that people around you uh, 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 approach and uh, requirements engineering obviously is one one uh, highly visible um, uh, certification scheme. So uh, we 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 tend to be connectable to those to those uh, uh, other certification schemes such as software testing and and requirements engineering. So we came up with the advanced level user requirements engineering. So that's 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 as much as I want to say about the the history of the of the UXQB. And now I want to go into more, more uh, interesting, more interesting uh, information, uh, technical uh, information. Um, everybody is talking about usability and user experience. And uh, when you talk to people, what do you mean when you say usability, or what do you mean when you say user experience? You can expect all kinds of answers. And uh, because of that, it is important in particular, if you work for international organizations, if you work as part of an international organization, or if you are a contractor with an international customer, it is very important that all people who work in a project have the, the same, a common understanding of uh, what's meant by usability and user experience, because if you have different definitions going around in the project about what is what, you cannot really communicate with each other. Now, what does this figure show us that I have in front of mine? In the center, we see uh, something called actual use and uh, usability is all about actual use. Actual use means what happens while people use a product. And usability is defined as the fact that users of a system can get their job done effectively, which simply means they get the results out of the system that they were intending to get out of the system. Effectiveness means some user has come to the result that he wanted to have from the system. That is the 
absolute lower level, lowest level of usability to be effective because plenty of people start working with a product and they don't get anywhere. That doesn't mean that you get the result. Uh, and effectiveness is the basis for another attribute of usability, which is efficiency. And efficiency is all about getting to your result quickly. Not only quickly, but mainly quickly. That's what we associate with, with the term efficiency. But efficiency is uh, defined as uh, the extent to which you have used resources to get to where you want to get to. And uh, making people effective and efficient typically leads to satisfaction. If you start a software and you get your results uh, without any extra effort, we would assume that users are satisfied with what they have just done. And this is the definition of usability. Make people effective means get them to the output they want to get to. Make them efficient means get there with minimum effort. And as a consequence of this, this uh, get them satisfied. You could say when it comes to usability and you look for the, the lowest level of satisfaction, it's actually simply the fact that no one complains. You know. Uh, you could say absence of dissatisfaction as the lowest level of satisfaction in terms of, yeah, it's okay, does the job. Uh, so this is what we call usability. And it's defined as such in an ISO standard, ISO 9241 part 11. Now, about 10 years ago, at least in uh, on ISO level, probably 20 years ago already discussed in industry, it was discovered that people who use a product actually imagine what it would be like to use the product before they use it. So it's quite obvious. If you go to the shop and you buy whatever product that you see in the shelf, before you consider it, you look at it and you try to imagine what it would be like when you have it in your hands and you use it. This is called anticipated use. Um, you know, when you hear this the first time, you might look at this as an esoteric concept. Uh, where you wonder what's the relevance of this, but in strategic product management, not project management, strategic product management, uh, we can see that uh, people who are able to really anticipate, to really imagine what it would be like if you had a certain product uh, are rather willing to buy the product. And effectively, when people consider a product that they buy, they conduct a usability test in their mind because they imagine what it would be like to have this product. And if this, let's call it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a tricky consideration I'm making, but let's consider the usability test uh, passes in the mind of somebody who uh, considers to use a product. Once this initial usability test in your mind has passed, then you actually use the product. You buy it and you use it. And if you use it and what you experience while you use it is in line with what you expected or better, then we would say during actual use, you really have a positive user experience. What you experience during actual use is referred to as usability, but anticipated use, positive anticipated use and positive actual use lead to people who consider after after they have used the product who consider to well to actually spread it. Whenever you had a good experience with with a system, you actually talk about it. You tell others, you say, hey, I downloaded a certain app and this is really great. And uh, I, I advise you, you advise your friends uh, to also use it. That means you had a positive digested use. And when we are designing products, it's important to get the anticipated use right, to get the actual use right, and to get the digested use right. This can go very far. There is a, 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 an online shop for buying glasses, which is now uh, uh, Europe's most successful online shop for buying glasses, you know, glasses in terms of eyewear, you know, the thing that I normally wear. This, this is what I mean with glasses. And this shop actually, uh, it's uh, www.mrspecs.com or .co.uk. If you want to find it, it's spectacular because they're very successful through usability and user experience. What they allow you is to try on glasses virtually in a, in a way 
that you really feel like you are wearing those glasses. You physically wear them. Basically, they use a webcam. They have some clever software. And when you see a pair of glasses in their shop, eyeglasses that you consider, you could put them on and really move your head, you know, and have those glasses on and look at them from all angles and they really move with you. And if you ask yourself, what is that from a technical perspective, from a, from a usability engineering perspective, what did they do? Well, basically, they have built a user interface to anticipate, to try out the use of a product that you don't hold in your hands. And the result of that is that people can, uh, in, the, in the sense uh, or in the, in, the, in the context of glasses, quite interesting, people start trying out glasses that they have never ever considered before. For example, these glasses here, you know, I just put them on. Um, these are my current glasses. I have bought them online in uh, Mr. Specs and I would have never tried them even in an optician's shop, but uh, optician's shop. But once I had them in my face in that shop, I thought, hey, I, I think I look cool. This is good, wow. Never thought about those strong black glasses. Then I bought them and now I'm extremely happy with them. So I did exactly what this shop was hoping me to do. Uh, I was trying out glasses on a website and decided to buy them. And the, the purchasing process worked very well. So the usability of buying it was perfect. And now that I have these glasses, what do I actually do? I sit in a webinar, in an international webinar and advertise this company with their product. And uh, from a perspective, from the perspective of this uh, online shop, this is uh, what we call positive user experience. They managed to make their products uh, anticipatable. They managed to make you buy it without any uh, negative experience while you buy it. It was efficient, it was effective. I got my glasses and now that I have my glasses, I'm really happy about them. And still, I occasionally go into their shop and wonder about other glasses. Now, what did I try to explain you with, with what I just talked about? User experience is something that makes money. It's a concept that makes companies who are building so-called interactive systems, software and hardware, successful. Because the more people can find out themselves how something works, the more they then realize it works like it was promising me to work, they are likely to spread the product, be happy with it and talk about it. And this is user experience. And it's important to understand that this is not a marketing concept. It's just a concept of satisfying users of a system. And if we know that people already uh, uh, try out products without holding them in their hands, so-called anticipated use. And we know that once they have successfully used it, afterwards they digest what they have uh, uh, experienced. It's important for us to understand that ideally we build user interfaces for all those three phases of using a product. Um, and actually it was Facebook who first came up with a user interface for digested use, which is nothing but, you know, let me see if I get my hands in the camera, that interface, you all know it, thumbs up or thumbs down. It's a user interface that Facebook has developed, a very simple one, very easy to learn, very effective, very efficient, uh, that allows people to communicate digested use. They have experienced something that they liked, so they click on a button, I liked this, so everybody else knows that they have liked it. I just tried to explain to you what is really meant with usability and user experience. Okay, um, actually yesterday was so-called World Usability Day. Uh, for those who, of you who haven't noticed it, you, there's a website, World Usability Day, and every year, the second Thursday, it must be, maybe it's the first, I think it's the second. Uh, uh, anyway, every, every, every year in November, there is a worldwide event called World Usability Day, and in all, or in many cities around the globe, there are events where usability is being promoted, and I actually yesterday uh, spent the day at one of our major clients actually 
which is a company called Bayer. They are the ones who produce uh, aspirin, for example, which which is well known. And uh, they actually have their own, uh, meanwhile, their own Bayer Usability Day. They call it Bayer Usability Day, which is a major event in the company where all the IT people and all the people from business who are contracting IT for for uh, for the business uh, 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 gather and get the latest the latest experiences from their own company about about usability and user experience and i was invited as an external speaker there and the one thing i said when i started speaking was that i said ladies and gentlemen today is world usability day but unfortunately it's not world usability celebration day because there's not a lot to celebrate i'm afraid and you know anyway what i wanted to say is um Usability and user experience is nothing that is self-evident, even in 2017, that is self-evident in projects that we are part of and uh, in, in uh, it's, it's, it's something that, that, that on a daily basis we experience rather low usability than high usability. You know, really for a moment, don't think about your, your smartphone and your email app that might work well for you. Uh, think about the rest of things. And uh, for example, if you look at paper towel dispensers, you all know those things in 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 in, in public uh, toilets, or you know when you are when you are going to a to a toilet at the client side, and uh, you wash your hands, and then there is this this paper thing, and you never ever manage to get one single piece of paper out of it because every time you touch it with your wet hands, you just destroy the paper that, that you wanted to take or you take the full amount of papers out that are in that thing. And uh, that's, a, that's a very good example for a, a very simple product where we would think, well, come on, it can't be that, it, that uh, difficult to, to, uh, to get a, a piece of paper out of a paper, uh, paper towel dispenser. No, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And what you see in many places is that that companies often don't even put those paper towels in those holders anymore. They put them next to the next to this uh, device, and so so people don't have to worry about it. And just put it up from the from the shelf, you know, when you wash your hands. Now, why do I tell you all this? Uh, users are still frustrated by interactive products and services. There is not every single product that is usable in the world. Ninety percent of everything we're dealing with doesn't really work for us. If you go into online shops, sorry, if you if you go into your app store and you look for a simple app that, that solves a simple problem, you probably find 10, 10 apps or more for the same single problem and only one of them eventually you find out works for you. And most of them, you start once, you install them, you start them once, you look at the first page and you don't even touch it thinking, no, this is not for me, forget it. And then you install the next one until you found what you what really works for you. So look at the apps in an app store where you basically find 90% of everything that's in there is not usable and has a very negative user experience. So based on that, I just want to say, uh, obviously, uh, when designing uh, software and uh, other interactive systems like paper towel holders, um, there's obviously an insufficient number of usability and user experience people who are trained according to international standards. Because the international standards tell you all about how to do this, but for some reason, it's not obvious in projects to do this. So it looks like there is an insufficient number of usability and user experience specialists who are really trained in what they are doing. On the other hand, another interesting phenomenon that we find in projects is that user experience professionals are consulted far too late in the project. What we often see is that teams just start in a very engaged manner, start building a piece of software and uh, two thirds up the road, they get more and more feedback from people actually looking at the thing, asking questions that nobody asked before. And all of a sudden 
the team realizes, wow, we're having a problem. People want to work with that product differently or people don't find what they are looking for. People make errors repeatedly and don't know how to get out of them anymore. The system behaves differently according to what people expect it to behave and, and, and. And then all of a sudden, uh, user experience specialists are hired and being asked, look at what we have built so far. What do we need to change in order to make it usable? Hmm. Now, there's one wisdom that we uh, have learned over long years in, in uh, usability engineering and user experience engineering, which is you cannot test usability into a product. You can only design usability into a product. If you think when you do a test that what you find as part of the test you can implement immediately, that is unfortunately an illusion. Typically when we do usability tests, the findings that we have then are used for further releases of the product. Often they touch architecture. Uh, you see that if you really want to make it happen according to users' expectations, uh, you have to change the technical architecture of the system uh, because there's some flaw in there that leads to lots and lots of usability problems. Um, but from a technical perspective, it was perfectly working. So um, the statement I'm making here is if you consult usability and user experience uh, specialists uh, late in a in a development project, there's not much you can expect from them. They are not they are not uh, faith healers who somehow uh, do some hoodoo with the product and all of a sudden it becomes usable. You can truly forget this. And because of that, we're saying make sure you have usability people early in the project. Uh, once you employ them, when all decisions are made, they cannot really help you anymore. And that's a sort of a problem number two. Problem number three that we see with products, that's a, that's a fascinating one that should be really interesting for all uh, strategic product managers, uh, people who are supposed to make sure that a product that has been launched successfully stays successfully and spreads more and more. Uh, what we see with products that uh, start off as a, let's call it a viable, a minimum viable product, they often start off quite well the central the the central basic functionality that has been put into those products uh, is is working well from the user's perspective and now over time where the product is being further developed you can see that all of a sudden it becomes more and more strange and the reason for that is that new features are often implemented without taking the actual user requirements into account so you can add features to a product by making it completely unusable if you don't look at the real uh, user requirements that are the basis for the product. And uh, this can lead to, uh, a a, let's say, a deterioration of the market success of products over time. You start successfully and over time you're getting worse and worse with what you have if you don't actually consider so-called user requirements as part of the development process and just add new features. So this is where we this is where we actually are and the good news is there is a high demand for usability professionals in industry. Industry will tell you that to find usability professionals is not easy these day these days. It's really a war for talents and part of the the solution to this is to simply educate more and more uh, usability professionals in how to do it right and uh, as soon as or, or the more all of them speak the same language the more they can communicate with each other and the better the usability of a product will become. Um, more usability means more market success and uh, uh, UXQB's mission is to develop and maintain a worldwide unified certification program for UX professionals and this is being based on the development of a consistent quality standard. This is our mission. Okay. Um, UXQB certification offerings. So what's really in the bag? Let me talk about that. I've got one slide with a lot of information here but let's let's walk through it. Um, now I said, did I say that before? No, I didn't say that before. We have, uh, hang on, 
I jumped one on too far. Sorry, this is the one. This is the one I wanted to show you. So if you look at the at the certification offerings that we have uh, developed in within the UXQB, uh, first of all, we have the foundation level, certified professional for usability and user experience foundation level, and this is the basis. This one is the basis for going further, for going up here to the advanced levels. And uh, the advanced level certifications that we offer so far is the two on the left side. It's the certified professional for user requirements engineering. I'll talk about more in a minute. Then we have the certified professional for usability testing and evaluation. Also talk about that. And these two are actually uh, on the market in terms of you can take those certifications. And there's a third one that is currently under development. And this is the certified professional for three things. And the three things are interaction specification, information architecture, and prototyping. Now this is under development. We expect this to be launched by the end of 2018. Remember, uh, UXQB is based on voluntary work. Uh, everyone who's who's working in the UXQB is doing this for free. And that basically means, as we all know, that you do this uh, in your free time, like myself. And uh, so uh, it might take a bit longer before um, certification products are launched than actually planned. Uh, but let me say a few words about this one because this is under development. Um, many people ask, why didn't you simply call it certified professional uh, for design and uh, we tried to work ourselves around the term design. Design sounds nice, design sounds nice, but uh, design is a term that has so many dimensions and so many stakeholders to it that you want to be careful when you use it. And uh, UXQB does not have the mission to certify designers, it has the mission to, to certify uh, usability professionals who actually produce the basis for usable design. And uh, if you look into really advanced development processes and you look at how they do, how they build usability into the products, there are some, uh, let's say, process deliverables that really have to be taken care of by usability professionals. And one of them is the interaction specification. An interaction specification is basically a description of how users would interact with the user interface. Don't confuse it with use cases. Use cases uh, in, in many uh, uh, dimensions actually rather look at the interaction between the user interface and a technical system, but uh, an interaction specification actually purely looks at how people, users, interact with the user interface. And this has to be specified uh, when it comes to complex business applications or, or, or medical products even. You cannot assume that you simply start prototyping and somehow you will work it out. It's not that simple. To truly specify interaction in terms of what we call self-descriptiveness and conformity with user expectations, that takes a lot of modeling work from the user's perspective. And this is what we call interaction specification. Then there's another term in here uh, called information architecture. Now be careful when you hear the word architecture. We're not talking about technical architecture. We're talking about the way the information is organized for the user, the way the information uh, is uh, findable for the user. And obviously, uh, you know, you don't have to, to, to go far to remember the last time when, we, when you were looking for some item in some menu and you had no clue where it ever could be. Other people might have shown you and you said, ah, yeah, sure, now it's obvious. But the next time you were looking for it again, you didn't find it either. And if you ask yourself, what is it that makes you worry there on the user interface, it's actually uh, the information architecture that has been either looked at as part of designing the product or it has not been looked at. And if you, if you come up with menus where you see things like uh, 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 other 
versus, versus special functions versus miscellaneous. This is a this is a, a typical example of a, of a, of an information architecture where over time more and more things have just been thrown in, and no one really knew what to call them because they didn't look at the real sort of logical structure from a user's perspective perspective. And this is where you end up with other and miscellaneous as menu items. So information architecture is the second big block in the in the advanced level uh, uh, CPUX IIP. And there's a third one, which is prototyping. And prototyping sounds simple. Prototyping sounds like you just download a tool, for example, Balsamic. This is a tool which you can use to, to basically uh, sketch uh, user interfaces. So it looks like, oh, prototyping, sure, I've done this. I downloaded a tool and, and, and put something together. However, uh, prototyping uh, is a methodological approach. Uh, there are, there are uh, it's actually a logical process, how you build a prototype and how you evaluate it quickly with users to find out whether it works for them. And here you have to be very careful, you know, um, it sounds like, oh, well, we built something, we show it the users and then, you know, and then they say, yes, exactly. Uh, be careful. Uh, if you demonstrate something to users, it doesn't mean that they have, they, that they are able to use it at all. Because as long as it's being demonstrated, it always looks logical. And people say, yeah, 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 good, interesting. But once they put their hands on themselves, they realize, wow, uh, as long as uh, Mr. Guys showed me this thing, it was so obvious. But now that I have my hands on, I realize I can't do anything with it. So prototyping requires skills and methodology. And this is why it's part of the advanced level CPUX IIP. But this is future, this is to come. What we have so far is the foundation level and the uh, user requirements professional and the usability testing professional. So let's look into more detailed how to get certified here. Um, how does it all work? How do I get certified? Now, to begin with, you have to pass the foundation level. You have to pass the foundation level. That's the basis for everything. And uh, if you ask yourself, what are the prerequisites for, for taking the foundation level examination? To begin with, we, uh, we recommend that you have knowledge in the area of usability, but it's not a formal pre requisite. So basically, there are no formal prerequisites, but it is recommended to have experience, I, I would go as far as saying to have a bit of experience in the field of usability from projects. Um, because what I can tell you already is uh, the failure rate that we have for the foundation level is actually about 15%. There's a roughly 15% of people who take this exam do not pass it. Um, so don't expect this to be a simple exercise. Um, I'll talk about that later on and even have a, a test question as an example with me. So how do you get certified for the foundation level? Uh, the exam type is uh, either a paper-based uh, uh, examination or an electronic examination in a so-called Pearson View Center. Pearson View Center is probably, well, may be known by, by some or, or, or many of you. The Pearson View Center simply means that you do the test based on a computer. You sit down on a computer, you can uh, answer online, and this happens in a so-called Pearson View Center. There are 5,000 of them around the globe, probably one in Kiev too. And uh, so you can do it electronically through such a center or paper-based. And paper-based means you either go to a public event offered by ISQI, where they allow you to take the exam or you uh, take a training. You go to a training uh, of an accredited training provider and at the end of the training, they offer the tests or you come to a test at the end of a training, not having participated in the training and take the test there. It's a multiple choice test, our, our foundation level test, multiple choice. You get 40 questions and you got 75 minutes to answer them. If you are not a native speaker of the lang of one of the languages that the test is offered in, you can take 90 minutes for the test, but keep in mind or, or consider 75 minutes for 40 question means not even two minutes per question. And the questions are not obvious. They are not obvious. Um, so uh, this is how it works for the foundation level. The languages that we have the foundation level in so far is English, 
French, German, and Russian. The Spanish translation is in preparation. So that's as much as I would uh, say about um, the foundation level. And uh, for the advanced level user requirements engineering, in general, we assume for our advanced levels that uh, there is a theoretical test plus a practical test because advanced level means that you don't only certify knowledge, you also certify skills. And uh, for the user requirements uh, professional, uh, the theoretical test consists of multiple choice questions and open questions. So there are some uh, questions that uh, you have to produce text for. And on the other hand, there is a practical exam, which is a so-called context of use analysis. Now, what does that mean? Um, those who take the test for the user requirements engineering professional will have to watch a video a video in which an interview between a user experience professional and a user of a specific system takes place. And the user, in, as part of this interview, it's a 30 minutes interview. As part of this interview, uh, the person gets interviewed about their so-called context of use. Context of use is which tasks do they actually conduct? In which environment are they when they conduct their tasks? Which resources do they use together with the, with the system that you are considering? And uh, who are the users anyway? Um, so, uh, this is a, a so-called context of use analysis and participants have to watch that video for 30 minutes and they have to document the information that the user, the interviewed person has given as a so-called as-is scenario. I'll talk about that uh, later on, what that exactly means, but it's a, basically a narrative story. It's a full text story about what the person has said. Um, and uh, this has to be documented. And then you have six hours, six hours altogether to derive the user requirements from that information you got from the, in from the interview. In the interview, they don't talk about requirements. They just talk about what the person does. And based on that, the user requirements have to be derived. Now, uh, you get six hours for the practical test here to, to complete the practical test. And this is currently that with the documentation in terms of uh, curriculum and glossary is fully available in English. Uh, also, actually, the public examination, the public example examination is available in English. But uh, the, the certification test, I must admit, at this moment of time is only available in German. We are seeing uh, uh, courses being offered in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland at the moment. There is already inquiries from outside Germany, in particular UK, and the English translation of the test is in preparation. But the curriculum, all the, the data that you need to have to pass the test are already uh, available in English language. So that's user requirements, engineering, advanced level. The second advanced level that we have on the market is usability testing and evaluation. If you ask yourself why usability testing and evaluation, what's the difference? Well, usability testing means you are testing a product with real users and evaluation doesn't necessarily mean that you test with real users. There are inspection methods for usability professionals where you can find out potential uh, usability problems in a product without even showing it to users because certain design rules have not been followed or certain principles have been violated that would be state of the art and this is referred to being referred to as evaluation rather than testing so we have testing and evaluation and this also this advanced level also consists of a theoretical test plus a practical test and uh, the theoretical test here has meanwhile been uh, designed to be only multiple choice questions. Doesn't mean they are simple, but they are simple to, to, uh, to assess by, by an external assessor. Um, so there's a multiple choice test like in the foundation level, uh, but with advanced level questions, obviously. And the practical test for the certified usability tester in, as part of the practical test the, the testees, the people who take the test, have to conduct a usability test. They have to conduct a full usability test with three users, not at the same time, you always test with one user at the time, but 
the examination assumes that uh, people are conducting, planning, conducting and documenting a usability test with real users. The way it practically works is that you get an assignment by ISQI and uh, you have to decide when you want to start with it because you only get the assignment uh, for one week. So once ISQI gives you the assignment, you really have to, um, you have to conduct to complete the assignment within one week. Uh, so you basically register for your assignment and then you get your assignment at the point of time where you said, I'm ready to start and then you do it. And what you have to expect is uh, you have to uh, identify user groups for a specific website. Typically what you get as an assignment is a public website that you get only told about uh, at the day of your, the beginning of your assignment. Then you have to recruit, you have to identify who are the user groups for this for this website. What are the tasks they are, that, that are supported for those users by this website? And then you have to design test scenarios based on the real, con what we call context of use. And you have to invite users and conduct a professional usability test with them, which means you have to videotape everything you're doing from the moment where the, the users come into your uh, effective laboratory until they walk out again. All of this has to be filmed and please expect for this assignment uh, approximately three days of work. It's, 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 I've done it years ago and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's work, it's really work. And uh, so expect three days for, for completing that assignment. Some people take, take holidays to do this, others do it on the weekend. Um, anyway, uh, the practical test as part of the usability testing professional is obviously to conduct and document a usability test. And uh, the languages that this advanced, advanced level is available in is uh, English and German. Again, uh, for the advanced levels, you don't have to take a course to register for the, for the, um, for the test. There are experienced professionals in the field, obviously, uh, around who come just to the examination and uh, they might as well pass. Uh, but having said that, uh, there are plenty of courses offered for both user requirements engineering and usability testing and evaluation. And actually, uh, the trainers for such courses, they have to have shown that they have passed uh, the uh, certification with a minimum of 70%. By the way, I didn't say that so far. 70% is uh, the score that you have to have to have passed. And trainers, sorry, trainers have to have passed it with 80%. And both theoretical and practical. And I can tell you that this is a minority of people who manage this. So uh, you can expect that people who train you in those in those advanced levels uh, have have gone through have gone through through the certification in a in a rather hard way and uh, and uh, these are the requirements actually for for being able to to uh, offer trainings for uh, also for foundation level by the way a foundation level trainer has to have passed eighty uh, percent otherwise uh, it is uh, not legal to conduct trainings okay where are we. Um, the UXQB has a full set of documents uh, on, on its website. We are, I, I really want to emphasize that we are a very transparent organization. Um, we have a full curriculum uh, for each of our, of our certification offerings. We have a full glossary available for each of our offerings. There is a certification procedure which details what exactly has to happen in order to pass the test. Uh, for each of our, our offerings, we have a, a uh, public um, uh, set of test questions, which is actually a full, a full, uh, a full certification test for self-assessment only. Now, because I get this question again and again, uh, the, the real test is not the public test questions, okay? So, if you register for a test, don't don't think because you have learned by heart the, the public test questions that this is the way to pass. It won't work. Uh, the public test questions are for self-assessment only. Also, we have designed uh, 
uh, agendas for what we call a model course for each of our offerings where we say look if you want to offer courses and you you think about an agenda that works uh, uh, from the perspective of those participating um, this is part of our documents you can look it up you don't have to follow it as a as a training organization but it's a you know it's a guideline it's a guideline and actually those who, who m most of the training providers actually follow that guideline all of our documents are based on ISO standards that's important from our perspective UXQB is not here to create new knowledge UXQB is here to make sure that accepted knowledge in the field is being taught and being used to qualify people. So whatever you read in our documents is based on ISO standards. The main ones that you should really be aware of is um, there's a series of standards, a series of usability standards called ISO 9241. And ISO 9241 is a multi-part standard, there's plenty of parts. And the ones that we focus on as part of our certification is part 11. That's where usability is being defined. It's part 110. Part 110 contains the principles for human system interaction. Basically, a best practice of design rules on a rather high level. And uh, it's ISO 9241 part 210, which gives the process for designing or it, 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 it contains the process for designing usable systems. There's another standard series that is also uh, incorporated in our curriculum. And this is the so-called common industry format for usability, which basically standardizes the deliverables, the contents of the deliverables that user experience professionals produce. Okay. Um, this is a view on our website, uxqb.org. Uh, just that you have the, the link to it. There is the documents section and in the documents section you find everything I just talked about. Plenty of documents, languages that we offer those documents in so far. Um, this is maybe a, 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 yeah, a, a view on the process model, the underlying process model for usability and user experience engineering. Um, this is taken from ISO 9241 part 210 is a very popular figure uh, which shows that if you really want to come up with a usable system, the first thing you have to do is you have to plan activities as part of the process of developing that system relating to uh, usability and user experience. If you don't plan for user, user usability and user experience, there's no budget for it, it's not going to happen, full stop. And then this model assumes that as an initial step in a project, what you need to do is you need to analyze the context of use for the product. Context of use means to identify who your user groups are. And there's typically more than one distinct user group using the system. You identify what are the precise activities that we want to support with that system. Ideally, you describe those activities without looking at your system because people who are going to use your system, they have those activities already. And based on their knowledge about them, they try to complete those activities with your system. And uh, so uh, an, initial an initial phase, an initial activity as part of so-called human-centered design, that's the latest word they use, um, the, the initial thing to do is to analyze and describe the context of use for the system. And based on that, you derive user requirements. And based on the user requirements, you should actually do a design. And once you have designed something, you should always evaluate it because you can guarantee no matter how much effort you have invested in an analytical process, uh, you will find that there are still uh, usability problems in whatever you design, no matter if it's a low fidelity prototype or a high fidelity prototype, these are all technical terms from the curriculum, uh, you will find as part of an evaluation that you might have overlooked an aspect of the context of use that you might not have sufficiently specified the user requirements. So you find new user requirements as part of testing. And uh, last not least, you might find although you have done everything right up front, that you still have come up with an inappropriate design. 
and therefore we evaluate designs against user requirements we evaluate designs with users and uh, this is the process model that we apply for human-centered design now one thing i want to say is that um, this might appear like uh, some waterfall model to some of you but it's actually not intended that it's intended to be a logical model that tells you basically how, which information should be there in the project to make sure that the product will become usable not only information but also prototypes and 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 uh, uh, test reports and um, this can also be applied easily applied in an agile environment you can even apply this model for sprints you would say at every sprint we need to know what the basis is for what we are going to design here we need to have the context of user uh, available we need to have the user requirements how else can we design something and uh, we have to evaluate at the end of the sprint anyway if we do it in a in a decent uh, in a decent style so this model should not come across like a waterfall model where you spend three months in the context of use, two months in the user requirements, six months in designing, and one month in in uh, testing, uh, and then find out everything everything is wrong. Uh, it can be truly applied in an agile environment. Um, next thing I want to show you is just a, a snapshot of rather relevant terms from our curriculum. Uh, we differentiate the terms user needs and user requirements. They are often equalized in practice and uh, people uh, think that user needs and user requirements are the same thing, but they are not. If you have a real uh, innovation process, you would always make sure that you uh, define user needs completely independent from the system that you are designing because otherwise we say you immunize already you 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 basically derive what people need from your product ideas and that's a very very dangerous thing so if you look at the first need here where it says a presenter needs to know how much time is left in order to complete the presentation in time during a presentation with a fixed time limit that's exactly the situation i'm in it's exactly the situation i'm in and i'm, I'm you know when you when you wonder who is he what is he looking at when he looks up there uh, i actually look at the clock and wonder if i'm still on track and uh, but uh, while i look at it you see that i look at it and uh, which is not professional from my side and when i look at it i still don't know how much time is left because uh, uh, the the presenter needs to know uh, sorry, because I cannot see at that watch up there how many minutes are left. And the actual interface I would need at the moment is an indicator that uh, shows me how much time is left for my presentation, how many more slides are to come. And uh, of course, I see down here, I see actually I'm on slide 20 of 29. Um, but I don't really see how much time is left for my presentation. And, uh, you know, if, if those web conferencing tools, if they were uh, well designed, then uh, the facilitator could uh, set up that time and the, the one who speaks could see how much time is left, uh, maybe in conjunction with exactly the amount of slides that are to follow. And then you would have a much easier time as a, as a presenter to uh, come across as a cool presenter and to basically just finish in time with what you wanted to present. Okay, so that was just an example for showing what is a user need and a user need is that statement that I've shown up here and a user requirement would be for exactly that user need. With the system, the user shall be able to see how much time is left for his presentation. That is a, a user requirement for every presentation system and none of them support you with it. Of course, you can. I could have set up a timer here and things, things that everybody forgets basically when they start presenting. And uh, because of that, we would say a really a truly usable uh, pre presentation system does that automatically. Um, okay, so these are terms, user needs and user requirements. Uh, other terms, for example, the as is scenario, as is scenario is a description of the situation that people are in without your product in place. It describes the, the situation from the perspective of not having your product. And here you would see all the problems that people have and uh, the real situation that they are in. You would see how they work now. And based on that, you can actually identify 
uh, user needs and derive user requirements. Uh, this is what we call an as-is scenario. It's a free text description of the situation that people are in. And you might want to take some time after the presentation to read those two because they're quite interesting. I just don't want to read them out to you. This here is a use scenario. A use scenario describes the situation of a person once they have the product. And uh, this story shows how they interact with it and how they more effectively, more efficiently, and more satisfied master the situation that they were originally in. As is scenario, use scenario. Very powerful tools in usability engineering. Um, here I want to uh, uh, quickly have a look at the definition of the term use, u user interface. User interface is, you know, when we think of user interfaces, we always, and you look at, let's say, you look at a washing machine, you would say, well, the user interface of the washing machine is those five buttons up there where it says start and program and whatnot, uh, which is part of the user interface. But the definition of user interface is that it is all information and controls information and controls that uh, a system offers to the user because they need them to accomplish tasks. And if you look at such a simple thing like a water bottle and you ask yourself what constitutes to the user interface of a water bottle, well, first I would want to ask you what task does a water bottle support? And the task that it supports is drinking water. And a subtask within there is filling a glass. That's what people often do uh, in many contexts, that they fill water into glass. You know, I'm not trying to fool you. I just try to give you a description of how we document context of use, because when you document all this, you really find out afterwards what the user needs are and what the requirements are. So for a water bottle, we would say part of the user interface is the fact that you can see what's in the bottles. And the interesting thing is with bo most water bottles, don't tell you that there's water in there. They have all kinds of fancy words on there, but they don't really tell you, yeah, water inside. And uh, so the content of the bottle is part of the user interface, the height of the fluid in here. So if you would see by looking at the, at the bottle, this much fluid is in there, or water, sorry, not just fluid. Uh, you could make an informed decision, or you can make an informed decision about uh, whether you are going to, to empty it or not. And so uh, these are uh, a part, a part of the user interface. And if you look at controls on a water bottle, you see this thing up here. This is what you naturally call a lid. We would, as usability professionals, call it an open close tool. That's actually the intention of it, to open and to close the bottle. And for this, those lids are actually not at all efficient. You know, you turn and turn and turn. And uh, it's, not, it's not really efficient what you're seeing here. But anyway, uh, this is part of the user interface. And actually, every bottle has a, a control to hold it. And some bottles have an explicit control to hold it. This bottle here has an explicit control to hold it. Uh, you can see it and uh, it's much easier to hold this bottle than, for example, to hold this bottle next to it. Although this left bottle here looks maybe more beautiful, it's for children at least, it's, uh, it's a nightmare to hold it and to empty, to, to fill a glass. With the center one, it's much easier because it has an explicit control to hold it and to shake it. And uh, the right one is another interesting one uh, where you would see with certain user groups that this is a troublesome design. Anyway, uh, definition of user interface. This is what I wanted to, to introduce here. And here is a test question from our, oh, so anyway, <laughs> the answers are already highlighted. Nothing to worry. It's not like that in a test that the answers, the right answers are highlighted. But uh, the test question is, which three of the following components are part of the user interface of a car for a car driver, right? User interface of a car for the car driver. And there are six answers, six possible answers here. Uh, and in general, in our certification tests, uh, either one answer is correct, either one answer is correct, or two answers are correct, or three answers are correct. Never ever there will be four correct answers or five correct answers. And in the question, 
uh, you get a clear indication how many answers are correct. And in the case of a car, we would say, well, the three correct answers down here is the accelerator, because it's a control that you use as part of speeding up, the stick shift, which is another control that you use as part of speeding up or slowing down, and the tow bar, which you would use to connect something to the car. And uh, if you ask yourself, but why is everything else wrong? Well, a car driver doesn't use the license plate while he's driving the car. It's not part of the task. He hopefully never uses the bumper. The bumper is something that is there and it, it, it might protect us, uh, but we're not interacting with it and hopefully not interacting with it. And also the carburetor, which is something under the hood, a technical, functions, technical function that users don't interact with. So the three right answers are pieces of information or controls that users really need as part of conducting the task with the system. Okay. Um, this is a, a view on the certificate for the foundation level. Um, the foundation level uh, claims that the holder of the certificate is familiar with the general terms and concepts in the field of usability. It's a statement about being familiar with the terms and concepts in the field of usability. It's a pure statement about knowledge. And uh, however, I shouldn't under, under, undervalue it, uh, however, this applies to seven fields of competence, usability principles and guidelines, understanding and specifying the context of use, specifying the user requirements, specifying the interaction between user and system, usability testing, usability inspections and user surveys, as well as process management and use of methods. So it is quite a bit that you learn, that you have to learn uh, to pass the test, but to make sure you have a clear understanding of it. There is no practical test. It's the level of understanding those concepts that's being uh, tested here and certified. Okay. So uh, just a, a reminder or uh, coming back to what, where are we currently? User requirements has been launched in 2016. Usability testing has been launched in 2014 and interaction specification, information architecture and prototyping is expected to be launched by the end of 2018. Um, internationalization of the CPUX scheme, let me talk about also how to, how to uh, possibly join the UXQB, because I've seen that as a, as a question here. Um, now, the UXQB relies on national member organizations. UXQB is currently uh, constituted by one, two, three, how many, five, sorry, should have learned that by heart, by five uh, member organizations. And those member organizations actually uh, delegate national experts that are actively working for the UXQB. Those people are really uh, integrated in the development of or even change update of documents of the UXQB. Currently, actually, the, the CPUXF curriculum is under review and it's a very active crowd, uh, international crowd that works on, 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 on making the, the curriculum even more usable to those who it's intended for. And uh, so far, our member organizations are the German UPA, these are the guys who we obviously started off with, but also the British UXPA, UXPA UK is part of the UXQB, the Swiss uh, uh, UXPA, they, they gave themselves a different name, but it's the, the Swiss chapter of the UXPA. We also have uh, UX Denmark, which is the Danish uh, uh, national organization for usability and user experience, and also uh, UX Pro in Austria, which is uh, uh, the a professional organization for usability and user experience in Austria. And we welcome other international or other countries uh, who have um, um, in particular member organizations of the so-called UXPA, that's the word you see here, UXPA. In particular, uh, national chapters of the UXPA are most welcome to join a UXQB and then they can nominate national experts who then 
uh, are actively integrated within the UX, UXQB to further development our scheme. Um, now, that's uh, what I want to say about the, the international organization uh, of, our, of, of the UXQB. There's more and more countries investigating, but we, we always suggest that first you, ideally, first you form a national chapter of the UXPA, so you get all the the, the let's say the, the the engaged experts in your country to together and join and establish an organization of professionals in your country and based on that uh, that that's an ideal basis to then uh, become a member organization of the UXQB but we're very open here I must say that we're very open and we're happy to receive inquiries um, I think I'm almost there uh, this slide, I'm absolutely sorry I didn't update it in time. Sorry, Victor, that I didn't, I didn't see that one of the slides was not updated. What I want to say is, um, by the end of by the end of uh, September uh, 2017, we are already having 2,500 uh, certified usability and user experience professionals. The number is rising rapidly. Uh, remember, we only started in late 2013. We have reached two and a half thousand now, and it looks all pretty, pretty expanding. Uh, the majority uh, of which uh, have been certified in the countries that are highlighted in orange here. Uh, we have we have uh, Germany, we have the Netherlands, we have Switzerland, we have Austria, we have Denmark, and we have United Kingdom. Uh, there are interestingly more and more certified people up here in Norway, Scandinavia, and there are uh, more and more individuals in other countries around the world. We have certifications in the US, we had certifications in China. Uh, there are people, I think there are the first people from far, from those, let's say, uh, countries far away from, from, from where I'm currently sitting. I'm sitting in Germany. Uh, most of the people or all of those people from far away have taken, have passed or taken the examination through Pearson View. We don't yet have uh, training providers everywhere. We are engaging companies to, to offer this. Actually, I, I have a feeling that uh, the next country that is picking up on this is this one down here. Italy, we get more and more inquiries from Italy, but uh, the current status is that we have uh, 2,500 certified professionals uh, around Europe and the rest of the globe. And that's actually as much as I wanted to say today. So thank you very much for attending. And uh, I would now want to hand over to Victor, I assume. Thomas, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think uh, we could have a Q&A session, session right now. I, I see that now we have several questions. So okay. could, you please, could you please be so kind to answer them? Yes, let me see. Uh, is it the questions in the chat? Yes, exactly. OK, so I'll, all right, so let me just go through and see what I can see. Turn on the voice, OK, <laughs> fine. Uh, let me see. Okay. Could you please share schedule program for tomorrow? Yes, it's done. Question to you. I think you should start from the end, not from the beginning. Right. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that's right. Here we go. Let me see. Uh, can you give us the link of the website with the glasses? It's interesting to see. It's absolutely interesting to see. I don't know how to. Well, can I type it in here or how do we do this? Yes. Victor? Yes. Okay. Ah, oh, here we go. Hang on. So first, sorry. First, I just gotta. Just, I just want to make sure I have it. www. Uh, Mr. Specs. Uh, oh, there it is. Mr. Specs. Com. I think. Give me a second for this because this is highly relevant. Actually, if you want to. Yes, here it is, and it's still in German. Let's put it to English. Hopefully, the website does it, and here we are. Perfect. So. Uh, Thank you very much for this question because uh, this is a, a really relevant website to explain the concept of, of uh, all right, you found it, thank you, to explain the concept of user experience. It's, it's the, the, the most marvelous website to do so. So let's go up. Um, let me see, what are the requirements for joining UXQB? Well, I explained to you a minute ago that uh, 
actually the question came up before I explained it, that's why it's here, but the best is if you want to join, if you want to actively participate in the UXQB to join through a national member body. And if you are in a country that is not yet national member body, our advice would be to set up ideally a national chapter of the UXPA. If you if you go to the web and you check for, well, is it UXPA.org probably? I typed it, did I? I thought I typed it. Try again, www.ux, sorry, UXPA.org. Uh, the UXPA is the, or, uh, the official international association of usability and user experience professionals. And they allow you to set up a local chapter. And once you have set up that local chapter, obviously you are building a community of, of uh, experts, uh, usability and user experience experts in your country. And once this is formed, I would recommend to get in touch with us. So that would be my, quest my answer to the question, uh, what are the requirements for joining UXQB? What about Ukraine? Well, you know, something to be discussed maybe after the presentation. Or Belarus and Russia? Well, uh, again, to be discussed based on what I just uh, explained. Uh, what else do we have? All questions regarding exams? Oh, all right, that was already from you. I think that's about the questions that were asked, uh, Victor. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm happy, you know, if you have another final question, you know, I'm happy to answer it. And uh, having said that, obviously on my slides, you see uh, our email address, you see the email address of Thomas Geis. You also see the email address of Marcel Schwarzmeier, who is actually the, the, uh, the manager for the UXQB at ISQI. And we are very happy to, to answer questions tomorrow, the day after. Maybe not tomorrow because there I'm on an airplane to Washington, but uh, in the beginning of next week, I'm, I'm very happy to answer your questions after the webinar. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, do we have any more questions? I assume it's Friday and uh, it's um, evening, so. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, thank you very much. Okay. Thomas, uh, thank you very much for the for the nice presentation. I see that uh, mostly nobody left the webinar. It's uh, not good, it's just perfect. Thanks especially a lot to you, Victor. Yeah. Especially on Thanks Friday. Okay. Exactly. So. Th Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present here. It was my pleasure. And I'm looking forward to continue to work with Codespace and, and all the interested people in the field. Thank you very much. Okay. So, thank you very much. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, guys, I would like to thank you to everybody who was within us during the five days. Today is Friday. I think uh, everybody is a little bit tired today. But anyhow, I think we had a very nice presentation from Thomas. I hope you enjoyed the SQI certification days and I hope you find out a lot of interesting things about the modern certification um, there are in Europe and um, in the world. Uh, I would like to mention that Codespace is uh, the partner of SQI and we are ready to help you and ready to consult you regarding the exams, um, regarding the certified trainings and all things about this. Later, this week, I think tomorrow, or probably today's evening, you will receive the links to mock exams, which is basically the simulation of the real exams, except the quantity of questions. The target of this is uh, to give you a vision and to give you to give you a try to get certified. It's not the real exam; you will not receive uh, the certificate. But you can check out how it works and what questions you expect on the real exam. Uh, next week you also you will also receive the FAQ where we will try to put everything about the exams, about how to register, how long does it takes, uh, what uh, are the options. Uh, anyhow, I would like to remind you that code space is. Uh, partner of SQI where you can pass the exams and you also uh, can receive the uh, accredited training. 
basically IREB and uh, and the ICQB, its uh, certification are currently provided by the code space. Uh, thank you very much to be to be with us. Special thanks to everybody who was with us this Friday, Friday evening. So enjoy the weekends and see you. Bye.